I'm broken. Also, it's post-finals drinking night. Uh, yes. School is over, but final grades have not been released yet. I'm... So it's time to celebrate before we have real reasons to drink depression. <laughs> But tonight, we have so much news, so much ridiculous news, and I think we should start with the 10-ton elephant in the room. Diablo 3? Diablo 3 came out! And for those of you who went to midnight releases and hoped to be playing early this morning, good luck with that. It was down. Uh, well, okay, so you're the only one of us who actually bought it. Did you get to play it at all? I have. I played about an hour of it before the show. <laughs> Did you encounter Error 37 on launch night, or Error 6? I, I have not been hit by any specific errors, but that's mostly because um, last night when I went to pick it up, I was still in the process of unpacking all of my personal possessions into my brand new apartment. That's right, we're on Nerd Talk Studio 3.0. Also still without a studio cat. Very sad. Um, but because of this, I determined that... I was not going to attempt to play Diablo 3 until I had finished unpacking all of my stuff and getting the studio set up. Poor Nate. Yeah, we've got friends who were who like took the day off of work to try to play it. And then could not. So he went into work. <laughs> Ironic. Right. Um, no, boss, I'm not sick or anything. I'm here. Just don't question it. Don't question it. I got better. I thought you had the plague or something. I got better. <laughs> I thought you were turned into a newt. I got better. All right. So, continuing. Um, yeah, I didn't attempt to play Diablo 3 until, I want to say, 3.30 Central Time was when I tried to get in. And at that point, the servers were just completely offline. So I could not play until we had returned from... Uh, from an, an expedition. Right. So at about, I want to say, 5.30, I did manage to get myself online. Two. And did play for about an hour as my uh, uh, sorcerer, Rengrave. Oh, hold on. I'm going to make a prediction without having seen any Diablo 3. It's a lot like Diablo 2. Uh, that's kind of an understatement. It It's very much exactly Diablo 2. Um, they the didn't even up res any of the textures. You start oh, the rogue encampment. No. Yep. It, it's actually the same game, just with new classes inserted over the old ones. It's not actually even new classes. They just literally released Diablo 2 again. It's, I wouldn't put it past Blizzard. They didn't Blizzard. change no, the it... title screen. From what I've played so far, no, it is... we spent extensive time looking at the login screen. Yeah, no, I, I've become intimately familiar with those birds. All of their textures and shaders. I know everything about those two birds. So, yeah. where do you start? That's, that's the premise of Diablo 2. Okay, or 3. 3. Hold on. <laughs> I could go over Diablo 2 if you'd like. Well, the premise of Diablo 2 is that the hero from Diablo 1 imprisoned Diablo in themselves. And well, so they've, they've actually expanded on that. They've gone so far as to name who that hero was in really? the first game. Did they? Yeah. The hero in the first game was the eldest of King Leoric's two sons, the youngest one being the one that Diablo possessed. Uh-huh. And so at the end of Diablo 1, Leoric's son rammed the soul stone of Diablo into his own skull and proceeded to become possessed by Diablo, which triggered the events of 2. Okay, and I, I was comfortable in Diablo 2 with Diablo having possessed the hero of 1 and sort of being at large again. But you, now you that still he's were at the large hero again of on one. 3, I feel right. like that this guy keeps escaping our... Is this going to matter when we capture him this time, or is he just going to get out again? Well, for what we know about 3 at the start of the game, and this is as far as I've gotten because the plot has been kept very much under wraps, which I do enjoy. I, I like it that we're treating Diablo 3 like it has the same level of spoilers as, say, the Old Republic. Um, what we know is that a meteor has fallen and struck the original Diablo Cathedral, uh, causing Deckard Cain to fall into the depths 
And so you as a hero showing up in this land that is completely torn to shreds. Yeah, you're just kind of a hero who's wandered in hearing that, hey, New Tristam is a cool place. The dead are rising. The, there's there's horrible corpses that spew, uh, spew uh, acid. Uh-huh. You're just a hero showing up for your own reasons to investigate what's going on. And then you get dragged into this. So, for instance, I'm playing as the sorcerer right now who is all about, like, arcane secrets and power at any cost. So he showed up in town having run away from his uh, training, thinking that he's better than his masters, uh, seeking the comet to plummet uh, magical secrets. All right. That is... But each character has their own reasons. Exactly the premise of Torchlight. Yeah, if you're playing as the demon hunter, you show up to hunt demons. If you're playing as the barbarian, you've shown up because a quest has led you there. Uh, so that sort of does not integrate into the Diablo lore at all, right at the very beginning. Have you right. gotten to any Diablo lore? Yes, the Diablo lore I found is Deckard Cain. <laughs> and he was an old he's guy kind of the, one, and then he was he's a really the source old guy of Diablo two. lore. He's been through a lot. Is he going to die at some point? Con- considering Diablo 3 takes place 20 years after Diablo 2, like, we've had quite a bit of time. It's amazing that Deckard can even walk. But yeah, so far, um, it it plays a lot like Diablo uh, 2 in the fact that, you know, you've got your buttons that queue up attacks. Um, you do have health potions linked on your bar. Like, you've got your inventory system just as before, your character's paper doll that you equip stuff onto. The only major difference I've seen is that your moves themselves level up and become new abilities via their rune system. Okay. You unlock various runes that get attached to abilities, and through picking those, you change what the power is, what it does. So, for instance, at level 4, I unlocked a rune that allowed me to power up my basic magic missile attack. Cool. Now, whether those runes stack on top of each other or whether you have to pick one rune per uh, attack, I'm not quite sure yet. I haven't gotten there. Um, I'm assuming the talent tree is going to be back. I just haven't gotten to it yet. Uh I imagine that unlocks at level 10. A uh, new thing from Diablo 3 that I know exists is that the basic skill tree has been completely removed. Or rather, it's there, but when you level up, the game assigns all of your points to skills for you automatically. And you don't get any input into it. And Again, I haven't gotten to like a talent tree yet, but I do know that the game essentially picks your skills for you. Is it is it skills or is it just uh, stat points? Because I think you pick spells like active abilities, but yeah, the you, stat you have points... active and you have secondary abilities, and yeah, you don't worry about stat points at all. I think Blizzard realized that people don't want to have the opportunity to put stats in the wrong uh, statistic. That the official motivation statement for that was that. If people are just building their own stats and they're not following a guide, then they're going to build their stats suboptimally. So yeah, you you don't want to do that to people. But I, I, I I'm the wizard that took strength. Great. You're at not the same going time. I feel like that's game. kind of the core gameplay of a progression-driven game like Diablo is trying all to the build loot, the man. strongest character. I mean, it's clicking and loot lust, and the purpose of yeah. loot lust is that you want to increase your stats, and it's your decision making as to how you want to build your character that's kind of the gameplay at that point. But really, running off of the same thing of World of Warcraft, you didn't get to assign your stats in that game, nor do you in most MMOs. Right. Realistically, it's your gear and your choices of your active abilities and your talents that are going to change your character. Taking away the ability to assign stats incorrectly, I think is a valid thing. Right. Like, sure, you could do it in a way that worked, like say you're building your necromancer to just have a ton of health. Okay, that's a thing. You can do that. But at the same time, if you really don't know and figure, yeah, I guess I'll put a couple points in my strength stat, 
something that the necromancer would never use, you're going to finish the game at a, at a higher difficulty than you intended to make it. Right, but at the same time, just taking out the stat tree does not make building your character automatic because you still choose which loot you equip, right? Yep, you still choose your loot, you still choose your runes, your active spells. So could That's you as a necromancer deal. build a really bad character witch doctor. by way of gear? We, we dropped the necromancer, we now have a witch doctor. Right. Um, potentially, yeah. If you're equipping the wrong gear, like, Diablo is still totally a random loot drop system. There There is nothing that determines, like, hey, you're this class, we're going to give you this item. So I guess my perspective on it would actually be that this does not minimize people being able to build bad characters, but it sort of consolidates the decision-making into one place. Right, it takes one step out of that. And I guess I'm okay with that. Uh, before I started right. the show, I was fairly negative on taking out the stats it, because... It didn't need to be there, to be honest. I Well, I feel like um, discerning how the world works and intuiting that, okay, I'm a caster... Strength probably isn't that important to me, uh, but then I'm in these situations and I feel like I need more HP, so maybe I'm going to put some points in Endurance or whatever. That is the right. fun part of Diablo 3, is that sort of problem-solving intuition, or of a loot-driven game, is that stuff. And so taking that out makes it sort of just clicking for me. And you mentioned that that's not in World of Warcraft, and I kind of don't like World of Warcraft, but yeah. Right. I, I'm probably okay with it just being consolidated into the gear. Well, it really feels like Diablo's trying to be a more story-based game, so you'll have various NPCs around the town that will share stories with you just as before. Um, there, There's a lot of just free roaming that you get to do besides, you know, I'm out in the map combating, uh, fighting things. Like, it... It's a really pretty improvement on the game, and like I know people were initially complaining about the the change to the Diablo color palette, but I can see stuff now, and there's colors, and it's cool. Yeah, it all the looks good still, to me. The game still feels like Diablo. A yeah. lot of the reason Diablo 1 and 2 looked like they did is because they didn't have the technology to make them look any different. Right, and it's still kind of limited. I mean, you, you can't freely rotate the camera, and there's only two settings for zoom and zoom out. Like, uh -huh. there, it's it's a toggle. It's a toggle that moves the camera closer to your character. Well, this is almost exactly the camera philosophy of StarCraft 2, because StarCraft was in 2D, and now that StarCraft 3, or StarCraft 2 is in 3D, they can ostensibly move the camera around any way they want, but they don't let you, because you kind of don't need to. Yeah, and well, so, it, it gives a more static view of the map, uh, a more uniform view. Uh, so it's, when, it's a very similar camera philosophy between Diablo 1 and 3 and StarCraft 1 and 2. Well, basically, if you want to look around freely, play World of Warcraft, is I think Blizzard's thought. Or I'm sure uh, World of Diablo will be coming down the pipeline eventually. Oh, I'm going to totally sidetrack us by throwing out the name Project Titan. Have any yeah, of you we heard still that? Don't, we still don't know what that is. Well, it's it's at least a thing. Yeah, uh, it's the rumored next MMO from Blizzard. And it is not just a forum rumor, it is a rumor that sort of comes from Activision Blizzard. Yeah, we so. just don't know what it actually is. It could be World of Starcraft. Hell, it could be World of Blackthorn, for all we know. That'd be awesome. I'm World glad someone Lost else Vikings. remembers that game. I want to play World of Lost Vikings. Just all of the Vikings in the whole world are lost. <laughs> Find them now. It's just like Bejeweled, and you have to match three Vikings. <laughs> that would be a really gonna, funny for Blizzard to do. Where's Waldo? I really did. That would also be pretty cool. Just have, like, a AAA game company uh, announce, like, leak rumors of a project and then announce that it's coming out all of a sudden and then release it, and it's just, like, a match-three game but named something like World of Lost Vikings. 
I, I just want to see more high-end game companies just randomly announce things with the intention of, oh yeah, we're actually just going to gauge people's response to this announcement. So we'll with totally more high-end s- game companies to just announce things to troll the world. Not even troll, but just to gauge what audiences think. Okay, so Diablo, we're going to be talking about it more next week, so we're going to hold off on more Diablo-based discussions. Like, I, I want to keep chatting about it, but honestly, I've only spent an hour in-game. I mean, I could talk about the amazing uh, frustration from Blizzard fans that happened let's today. Let's talk about that! Do, do we want to? I mean, like, holy Didn't crap, it is it. everywhere. Yeah, totally. but we, all, we also need to talk about the Paladin Shield bug, wherein Paladin. you can potentially crash your game and delete your save by changing the shields on uh, Probably the mercenary higher. Okay, so, you know, it it's it's basically... It, what we have here is Diablo 3 is an MMO. Like, there, there's no way around it. It is an MMO so that gives you the you option with? to single play. Anyone you jump into games with. Like, you can jump into other people's games and play together. That That's a thing. That's been a thing since the original Diablo. But we have Always On DRM, which they're not calling it DRM because Blizzard doesn't like that term. But that's what it is. Like, you have uh, to, you have to log into your Blizzard account to play this game. There is sort of an argument that they gain value from having you be online all the time. And even if they lived in a vacuum where they weren't thinking about piracy, somebody might design a game this way. But it really sucks kind of that there's not a offline mode and that has resulted in a lot of people being unable to play it this night yeah because in order to play you have to log into the blizzard servers and let's face it blizzard is never prepared for the popularity of their games well that the notorious error 37 stands for the authentication servers not being able to log you in because they're too busy and that is what is preventing most people from playing Admitted, the one time I tried to log in, I did not get it. Um, well, sorry, the one time I tried to log in when I knew the servers were up. Mm-hmm. Like, I tried to log in initially, and I didn't get in because the servers were down. They were doing emergency maintenance. And now there's a patch. And now there's a patch. So that's two day one patches. Go team. Up there. But, like, um, it, it shouldn't surprise people. Like, this, this is essentially an online game. And online games are notorious for having glitches in their first, like, week of existence. This is a thing. Uh, I think Pyro wanted to bring up something specific about this error, though. Okay. Why do they call it Error 37 when they could call it Server Overload Error? I mean, computers have the technology to use words now. And all you'd have to do is have it, instead of, say, Error 37, say, Servers Overloaded Error. And that would be way more meaningful. My honest guess is that they code those errors like that because they don't want fans to get the idea of what's actually going wrong. And they, they, they figured it out really damn fast. Every, but there's lists of what the error codes are. Like, I mean, error six is no Diablo 3 license associated with this Battle.net account. That's and not a good one. <laughs> error 3006 means um, save game to synchronization. And why do they call them 3006 instead of save game desynchronization? Uh, 3006, at, by the way, is what happens if you trade your equipped shield with a Templar hire E. And it, it boots you out of the game and you Deletes lose your save. your save. Yep. It's a hell of a glitch. And it will probably be fixed by the time this podcast is posted. It might even be fixed already, but right. it was in at launch. I'll, I'll put a link to the story. It's a, a heck of an error. So You undid existence because you traded your shield. How dare you? Blizzard very wisely included some gift codes with purchased versions of Diablo 3. Right. And that is... Sen giving a gift code to me is probably what will get me playing Diablo 3 at all. And probably once I'm in the front door, 
I'll sign up the whole way and buy it for sixty bucks. But if they hadn't it's, done that, it's I a pretty brilliant strategy. All, so, good work, Blizzard. Yeah, I, I gotta say, Blizzard just including the free guest copies with all of their games, that that is a brilliant marketing strategy, and I wish more game companies did that. I, that I will, I will definitely say, Mass Effect Three, including the, uh, the free two days of, of Xbox Gold, not quite good enough. What actually sold me on that was Pixie informing me. The next day that, oh, there's a special two months of Xbox Live for $2. How so can that's, say no to that? Yeah, and I'm probably going to keep the subscription. Uh, I actually think it expires or gets up to today. I think I'm just going to keep it because, honestly, I've been enjoying the experience. The other thing oh, about yeah, the Diablo 3, <laughs> mm-hmm. 3 guest code that makes it work for me is that it's not a time-limited trial. Yeah, I saw it's, that. You can play up to level 13 and through Act 1. and You can take as much time as you want and do it as many times as you want. Yeah, if you want to oh. try out every class, you can. And if you decide if, to up to upgrade to the full version, you get to keep those characters. If it was like a free 30 days, I probably would have thought, oh man, well I'm busy this week, and I'm busy now. I'll, I'll redeem this guest code later when I'm going to have more free time. Yep. And then I'd never have more free time, and I'd never buy the game. But because it's the first part of the game, I can just redeem it now and download it and play it when I get a chance, and then buy it. So, yep. Heck also of, good on them for that part. Heck of a deal. But we'll have much more coverage on Diablo 3 next week. Yeah, we'll, we'll do the full review thing. I'll have plenty of time to play it. And it's good to actually be getting back to game reviews now that the horrible semester from hell is over. Indeed. School. School. Yeah, my my final paper for my grad level course, 53 pages. Yeah, ouch. Right. That's a lot of pages. Did they make you print it out? Yes, they did. Twice. Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, no. It's Did like they want you to like print it out on nice paper or no? It it was on standard uh, photo paper or standard okay. copier paper. Your photo paper would be really expensive. Oh, photo paper would suck. That that professor is a complete jerk. Yes, you will print this out on photo level paper. I want to revel in the glossiness and how much it cost you. Then I'm going to you must print with your it. essay out on sheets of gold. You must print it out on the tanned hides of undergraduates. <laughs> you must get mo- you must get monks from Italy to inscribe your essay on grains of rice. Actually, on that level, well, not that level, but on a similar note, um, I I figured being the author of a graphic novel, well, hopefully, and uh, and getting the art done by Pyro's sister, actually, who you know, have to thank you again. I, a pretty good artist. I would be the one... She's a super good artist. I hope we embarrass you talking about how good your arts are. I figured I would be the one in the class who did the most work and therefore qualified the most for the A. You know, I'm not only writing, I'm the one who actually got production art made for my uh, piece. No, one girl in the class who came in with a fantasy novel half-written finished the novel printed it, and created a bound copy to turn in with her final portfolio. Very nice. So, like, I got nothing. You made a book and printed it. The funny thing is, the actual printing of books in book form is actually really not very hard. For the sheer sake of it, I have written just... It's not really a novel in the sense that it's complete or worth anything, but I I compiled some large amount of text I created and got it printed out in paperback novel form just for the novelty of being able to get it printed out in that form. And it was like 20 bucks print on demand. I got it in a week and a half. Yeah, but have you seen hardcover, the, the process of actually making and binding a hardcover book? It's act. You can do that print on demand 
almost as easily. It's just slightly more expensive. No, she, but even then, she it's was not talking about having to do like expensive. hand gluing and hand stitching of the book. Ouch! Right. Well, see, like we're talking the old process. Well, my attitude towards that is that it's kind of dumb for her to be doing that much work because you can have Lulu do it for you for very trivial amounts of effort. Eh, pretty much guaranteed her the A, though, so... Yeah, I guess so. And if it's a scene's a degree, right? <laughs> I take issue with the school philosophy of A for effort, which effort is a bad thing in the real world when you're doing something. Oh, no. If you get the same amount of progress and one person worked harder and one person worked less hard... The person who worked less hard was more successful. Technically, yes. So eff effort is, in the real world, if you're farming something, and your neighbor absolutely works his ass off and farms his crop, and then you get the same number of cabbages without having worked as hard, you did better. And so rewarding effort is kind of backwards in school. I mean... I, I sort of see where they're coming from, because you don't want to take somebody who worked really hard and punch them in the face. But from an education perspective, we're sort of instilling a work ethic that is contrary to how the world actually works. Well, technically, your future job is supposed to also look at your grades to evaluate you. Right, but your future job ostensibly does not want to hire somebody who works really hard but sucks and doesn't accomplish anything. So Your you... future job would much rather hire a lazy person who still manages to get everything done. So when you're in the interview with your straight C transcript, you can explain that, yeah, no, I, I did the bare minimum to pass, but I did it oh, while no. also doing what, what other I'm stuff. What I'm saying is that the education system should be designed to reward results. I see. And so if you get results but don't work very hard then you should get an A. Basically, he's advocating for the brilliant but lazy among us. Right, so you're arguing well, for the pass-fail course. You either no, passed not, not the course or either. you failed it. I'm arguing to take an attitude wherein work is not good in and of itself. Results are the good thing, and the work is the nasty side effect of the results. So the person who turns in their final is like, I spent 17 hours on this thing, doesn't get the same grade as the person who, who produced quality work and was like, yeah, I took three. Yeah, well, I mean, ostensibly, somebody who writes the same quality essay in a quarter of the time is a better writer. Uh, there's nothing more to that. If you're a magazine... You want the guy who wrote the article fast and still got it good. Don't you? It's true. So, uh, I'm not necessarily suggesting any real changes to the grading system, but it's the attitude that I take issue with. It's that people don't tend to value efficient results. People tend to value working really hard. But working really hard is not a good thing. Results are a good thing. Right. So, the other day I had to do a double take when I opened up Steam, and in the Steam top slot there was an ad that said, if you go to GameStop, you can buy Steam gift cards, and you can buy Steam gift cards using GameStop trade-in credit. And that's absolutely wild. Digital distribution is the future of game sales. Wild and by the fact that GameStop owns Impulse and is now supporting their chief rival. Yup. <laughs> if GameStop survives this decade, I will be astonished. And so... You personally walked into a GameStop. That's the part that I'm confused by. I have not purchased anything from a GameStop in about five years, but I went to a GameStop specifically to witness the fact that they sell Steam gift cards there. I think back Just, in the day you used to buy me, like, Sim games or something on my Game Boy. I bought you, uh, 
DS Sims game at a Best Buy. Ah, okay. So that was also not a GameStop purchase. That that's that may as well be a GameStop because I mean it's a similarly unsustainable business model, but it wasn't an actual GameStop. And also, Best Buy are less douchey with regards to, uh, you know, stealing on live codes out of new boxes and uh, selling trade ins at sometimes more expensive than the actual new copies. I, I've seen, like, multiple times with my own eyes in a GameStop that you can buy a used copy of a game for more money than a new copy of the game. And I'm like, what? <laughs> but uh, they seem to get away with it for the time being. But not for much longer, because I... If... Somebody walks into a GameStop and is like, hmm, I wonder what the Steam thing is, and checks it out, then that person is never going to a GameStop again. And so I figure... I wonder... Who decided that this business arrangement should exist? The especially wild thing about it for me is that you can get Steam credit with trade-in credit. Because this I almost is... want to take any game I own on disc, trade it into GameStop, and then use that trade-in credit to buy that same game on Steam. Because that'd be way more convenient for me. Yeah, I, I really think that digital Except distribution... you can trade in PC games, too, so I can't Right, you can't. I, I have PS2 games, but they're not those, on Steam. Those mostly. will trade in for like a quarter apiece. Yeah. If that. Also not worth anything. Right. I, I really think that digital distribution is the future. I love the idea that I took my Diablo 3 and attached it to my Blizzard account, and now anytime I go to a computer that has Diablo <laughs> 3, I can play my game. Can, can, yeah. we, can we bring up, while we're on this topic, in the age of digital distribution, why do I have to wait for this arbitrary release date for the stores? Why do we have to do that? I, in, in regard to what I think you're trying to get at, um, it, it's just so that the developers have an exact date, especially for online games. No, they, but I mean, like... It... Why can't you have your copy the moment it's done? Because if know, they... Out here. I if don't they, think I'm wording this properly. Okay. Well, there's a couple of things to that. Um, the main reason, as it stands, that release... Dates are synchronized with stores, and think StarCraft II like, was especially it. egregious in this sense because the digital version was made available 10 hours after the store version was made available. Right. But, 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 but if you think about it for a minute, the game has been done for weeks by the time it gets shipped out to the store. I, I can actually address this one. I, I know what you're getting at. Because if you did it the way you're suggesting, where the moment the game is ready and at the printer's, it's released. Anyone can go get it online. Brick and mortar retailers would throw a shit fit. Okay, yep. I, so I was ready to tell you you were wrong, but you're actually right. That is the reason. That That's the exact reason. The brick and mortars would go ballistic with that. You already have... But screw them. You can just cut them out of that. No, you can't, because... It. At the that moment, there are still enough old people and people who live in Oklahoma that don't have good internet connections. Yeah. Wait, we should that check our if analytics GameStop sure said... <laughs> no, we can piss them off. It's fine. Well, all the, all they've we, got don't have any, we don't have any listeners who don't have very good internet connections. Touché. Unless you saw us at a con in five years and you bought a CD from us, in which case, hi. Thanks hi. for your purchase. Welcome. We're glad to have your money. It also, bought me booze. 2017 and you still don't have a good internet connection? What's wrong with you? The hell? By the way, how was my cybernetic arm? Was it shiny? <laughs> But there are still enough people like that, that GameStop could say that if you don't synchronize release dates with us, we will not carry your game. Yeah, you and unfortunately that need those people. harm to the revenue of the game developer. Yeah, it, it's an not, unfortunate fact. That will not last much longer, but at the immediate moment, that's still true. Yeah. But I, I've, I've, and you know I've pointed this out before with music releases. Like, this... this this thing is already out like with region-based releases. 
Well, the right. same goes with movies. In, this is stupid. In this, some this markets, this already available in like physical form somewhere else, and it, I'm a, I can watch the music videos and stuff on YouTube. I just can't buy the actual music. Well, this is the, I import it. this is the whole pirating thing about going for R fives. So, all right. What I'm saying is, I would like to be able to buy this at the same time that everyone else can buy this. Right. Well, <laughs> in certain markets right now that aren't that don't have popular movie theaters, they just released the DVD for the Avengers. It's out. You can go pick it up in your native language because they don't have theaters there, so the company's like, "Well, we'll just sell the DVDs for a reduced price." And the reason that they don't make that available in the United States is because they want theaters people have to go to marketing the theater. leverage. Right. Like, if and I could go out to Walmart right now and buy a DVD copy of The Avengers, it would not only be uh, in my apartment, it would likely be the thing featured in my PlayStation 3 for the next week, two weeks. I would probably watch that thing daily. Or, if on the release date of The Avengers, instead of waiting in line, I could sit at my desk in my house right. and watch it on my giant 24-inch, well, 24-inch is giant from where I sit from it, <laughs> uh, high-resolution IPS display, then that would be much, much better than having to go to a specific showing and wait in line, and then there's douchebags talking behind me in the theaters. We're the only douchebags who talk during movies. <laughs> well, the movies that we've talked in have not been at launch, it's and they've not been good. I, I disagree. The last <laughs> Airbender was totally on opening night, but totally deserved it. Did we go? Did we, were we, was that opening night? We went to opening night of The Last Airbender and talked through the entire thing. But it was, uh, but it was so bad that we needed okay, to. Okay, I do feel kind of bad about that. But I guess my defense, I will state, is that we would not have gone to see it with the people who are around us if we had um, any other option. No one in that theater, even the hardcore fans, were upset with us. Except that one lady. Except for the people the, who tried to kick us out. Yeah, that one lady. <laughs> to be it fair, was such that movie that a sucked. theater employee showed up at some point. To monitor and decided us. we were fine and left. And then we went back to talking. <laughs> True. Can we say it was a bad movie? Like even from a fan standpoint, it was a bad movie. Yep, yeah, it Especially was a bad movie. From a fan standpoint. Like even Ong would forgive us for talking through that movie. That's right. I see what you did there. <laughs> God, they got one name right the entire movie. That that takes that that's intentional. This is like the amount of hatred that George Lucas must have for his fans. Uh, that reminds me. Brett was mentioning to me about uh, how he acquired the Airbender series. Yeah. And I mentioned to him that I'd only ever watched like an episode or two. And he's like, oh, well, the way that you and Dylan were, you know, talking during that movie, it sounded like I knew what I was talking about, I guess. <laughs> no, but there are things that you know. That you know how characters' names are pronounced, and that when it comes out wrong, this highly calls into question the nature of the film you're watching. Also, when you repeat lines over and over again, like, like you have to go. <laughs> re really, that movie felt like an amateur theater group getting together to try to reenact scenes. It's like when somebody who hasn't actually watched a show tried to describe to you what right. it's about. No, that, that's a completely Which, accurate way, description. Which, hilarious and fun if you can get people together to do that. Describe what you know about this show. So, all right. Um, do we want to do next topic? Uh, my conclusion about uh, Pixie's complaint about things not being available digitally before the discs are printed is that I think that is going to turn around very soon. I, I think as soon as a gold master is sent to a disc factory, that gold master will also be available for digital play in the relatively near future as we just have to wait a little bit yet yeah i'm guessing in the next five years movies are going to see digital release the same day as th theatrical release likewise i would games, like that a lot games will be available digitally 
I, I, I'm willing to say before the physical copies are out because it's becoming a big enough thing. Steam is a billion ben, dollar you business. Be we cave, know that. Because you have to go buy your stupid cardboard box, then that's on you. But that we know people who are going to do this. That should not be on me to have to wait because it's not fair. Like, because you need to yeah, I, have your stupid little box opening ritual. I, I'd say no. Blizzard is pushing this uh, forward the best. The, the same with Valve. Yeah, we'll let you download the game, and we're sorry, but the best we can do right now is that we will unlock it at midnight on the release date. Mm -hmm. That That's at least a step forward. That's really cool for the people who wanted to play Diablo right the second it launched, that they could already have it on their computer ready to go with their account set up and everything. Mm -hmm. they, they let people register for their battle tag in advance. So you had everything ready to go the second you wanted to play that game at midnight. That's true. That was really great. As opposed to the people who showed up for a physical copy and then, you know, they could only physically acquire it at midnight. But you know what? Home. I showed up for that physical copy and I got Diablo cake. And it was you worth keep it. keep bringing that up to everybody, but, I mean, honestly, was the cake that good? Yes, it was delicious. The, the store that I went to for the... Midnight release actually had the Diablo 3 box art made into like a 200 slice cake. Did that you they... get free cake? Yeah, it was free. No, you you picked up your copy and they're like, grab a slice of cake. Thanks for coming. No, it was, it was pretty awesome. It sounds good to me. Yes, this, this was worth showing up to, if nothing else, just for the cake. Mm. Alright, the true obstacle to... Uh, the day it goes gold digital distribution is that we need to invent the ability to download cake. Once we can download <laughs> cake, then it'll all work out. At that point, you can download your stupid cardboard box. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, I want the company to sell you the game online at a reduced cost, and then if you want the physical copies, like, packing material... You can, but they're going to charge you just as much as they would make it the retail version. Actually, come to think of it, I think Amazon did something like that at one point, where you could buy something and they'd give you the download, and they'd mail it to you once it was ready. Um, I remember the Mega Man uh, 9 release on the PlayStation Network. You could actually, there were a limited number of physical boxed copies of it. That they put out. Oh, that's like I don't cool. think I don't think there was anything actually in the box, but I believe that they actually did release box art and stuff for it. That because Mega Man Nine is so retro, what they should have done is have a NES cartridge in the box. Uh, maybe um, not even like a real NES cartridge, but like a plastic mold of a NES cartridge. I actually think that might be what they did. That would be pretty cool. So, Give me a second. To smoothly He's, transition between talking. that collector's edition bonus, I wanted to think about... I was, I was playing Monkey, T Monkey Island 2 this week. Uh, I beat Monkey Island 1 last week. Or maybe it was since the last podcast. But the Monkey Island 2 special edition is a bit more modern than Monkey Island 1. I, I still don't think it holds up very well. But one of the things the Monkey Island 2 remake had was developer commentary. And it's in-game, and when you walk into a room, you can hit the A key on your keyboard. And then it actually sort of shrinks your screen down and puts a Mystery Science Theater-style overlay with the three developers sitting in the corner and plays the, their commentary for that room. And it's kind of cool... But the actual content of the commentary still was not that good. Especially compared to what I'm used to being a Let's Play enthusiast. Uh, Valve has also done commentary tracks for Half-Life 2 and Portal and stuff. But their commentary has been incredibly scripted. Like, the people who do the actual commentary sound like robots. They're not talking off the cuff. They're very clearly reading scripts. And what so do you mean, Pyro? I'm reading these lines right off of my screen. 
Okay, well You now... spelled screen wrong. <laughs> I want to have, like, a teleprompter on, like, a shirt. On, like, the wrist cuff of a shirt. So you can be like, that was totally off the cuff. You're reading off the <laughs> teleprompter on your wrist. Yeah, but yeah. then you run the danger of people trolling your teleprompter. I'm Ron Burgundy? Okay, who put a question mark in? The I Love Lamp. I Love Lamp. Translated into, did you see that? Somebody put I Love Lamp on a newscaster's teleprompter and read it. <laughs> nice. I'm a dumbass. Okay, so I did find that information about Mega Man 9's release. Um, originally, it was a press kit that contained classic-looking artwork in a classic uh, NES box, and the game itself featured an NES cartridge that opened up and contained mini-CDs inside that had uh, game artwork, screenshots, and information. And then later, they modified the kit and sold it through their web store uh, for just fans. Pretty cool. Yeah, it was a neat idea. I mean, it, it worked. And people know what Mega Man 9 is. Uh, Mega Man 9 and 10 actually seem like really cool games. Because they're basically just Mega Man 2 again. But Well, that's what Mega Man 3, 4, 5, and 6 were. Uh, oh, and it, 7. We, we didn't diverge from the formula until we hit 8 on the Super Nintendo. That seemed pretty good. I, yep. I would play those games. But where I was going is that nobody has really done good developer commentary in a game yet. And obviously it's hard to do it in the interactive portion of a game. I, I've never seen anybody do good interactive commentary at all. Because audio tracks obviously have a time element. And when you're playing a game, you move through at a variable speed. But one thing that might fix that is... If there was a collector's edition that had a pack-in DVD or something that had a Let's Play on it by the developers, I would totally go for the collector's edition, because I think that would be so cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of against the Blizzard collector's edition at this point. Like, we, we know what all of the Blizzard's collector's editions are going to contain. They're going to be an art book, a DVD making of, complete with, like... Uh, the production shots from the previous uh, games. Sorry, not production shots. The cinematics. Um, and it's going to be like some kind of USB with the previous versions of the games on it. Uh-huh. That, that's every Blizzard Special Edition. Um, I'm, I'm just frankly bored with the concept of them. I don't want more random crap. I don't need an art book because all of the art assets are available online. Uh-huh. And what I, personally, especially don't need is any physical objects, because I, I want to buy my games digitally and then play them immediately, and that's that. No need yep. to clutter up my house with anything. Yeah, no, I, I was actually... I, I moved yesterday, all unpacking all my stuff. stuff in my life are right. cringing right now. You know, I, I was looking through my old gaming library and just realizing how many boxes I had. Physical objects are a hassle. So, if they had a developer LP of their own game, that would be something you could distribute digitally, would be really cool for people who are enthusiasts about the game, and would sort of give an insight into the game development process that doesn't exist in the world right now. That's a kind of content that nobody's making. Even outside collector's editions and stuff, the only the only developer commentaries I can name of any game are the Monkey Island 2, the Valve commentary tracks on Portal 2, Portal, and Half-Life 2, and the developer of I Wanna Be a Guy did an actual let's play of his own incredibly difficult game. He's actually really good at it. So, I guess he deserves it, to make it, that awful game. It's good to be game. good at your own game. Consequently, the guy who made Fez, yeah, he hasn't even gotten to the ending yet. He doesn't know where it is. <laughs> he still hasn't found the sewers and nope. not had to open that door behind the waterfall. Yup, not there. 
Moving on, next story. So the up oh, okay. you got more? No, that's fine. The most recent version of the public beta environment for League of Legends has just gone live and has some really neat little toys in it. Kind of beyond our usual just hey here's more skins or hey here's a new champ. But we'll get we'll go through the boring stuff first and then get to the really cool stuff. So we've got some new skins coming up. As always, we have Sad Robot Amumu. He's a little cute robot with the plug coming out of his foot where his uh, mummy wrap usually is. Eh, it works. They, they changed some of the effects on him to make more sense, so instead of throwing a bandage, he throws his electrical cord. We have Dark Flame Shivana, who's Shivana except a black dragon. With a purple flame effect. Yep. We have Tyrant Swain, who replaces his trademark uh, crow with... I don't know, what kind of bird is that? Is it like a vulture? I can't really see it from it, here. It's a long-necked black bird. Very long tail feathers. But, yeah, he's got, like, a formal crown on. He, he's very regal-looking this time. It's a very intimidating skin. And finally, we have more news on the recent uh, graphics update that's coming to Summoner's Rift. Because, you know, it's about time. So, this time around, we've got new versions of Baron Nasher and the various forest mobs. So, the dragon, golem, lizard, and wolves are all getting new models. We also have an animation coming in for the merchant. So no longer are we going to have the static, weird purple guy standing behind the cart. Now we're going to have this weird, like, prospector, uh, Yorl, who's going to be selling stuff. I don't, I'm, I'm kind of interested to see the guy actually moving around when I come see him. Will he say, what are you buying? I what wish. are you selling? But, like, I, I just think this is a good step in the right direction. This needed to happen. Because Summoner's Rift is really showing its age, especially if you play things like Dominion, or if you've seen the beta footage from uh, Dota 2. It, it's really obvious that some of the art assets in League of Legends need to be changed out. I hope, the, I hope Dota 2 gets released soon. I want to play it. Um, the other really important change that I'm, I'm really happy about is that if you're one of those people who enjoys playing ranked, admit it, I don't, because I don't like an overall st statistic following me between games. But if you're one of those people who really digs ranked, it's pretty much assured that those the, the 10 free-to-play champs per week are things you don't want to see picked in your ranked game on your team. Because chances are, it could just be someone picking these champs who's never played them before, who just wants to try them. You know, whether they're trolling or not, it's a ranked game, and so the results of it matter to you. So, for the sake of uh, balancing things out, Riot's issued a new uh, initiative where the free-to-play champs do not apply to ranked games. Huh. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. If you're playing a ranked game, you should know the champ that you're working with. Like, my other solution for this that I'd come up with a while ago was that in order to play a champ in ranked mode, you need to either have played that champ ten times, or you need to have played the champ ten times in either normal PvP games or bot matches. Uh -huh. To basically just demonstrate that, yeah, I know how this champion works. I can take him in this ranked game where I will be affecting other people's scores. And really, this is sort of a insignificant restriction because you already had to be level 30 to play ranked. And so the amount of IP you have accrued by the time you get to level 30 means you can own a whole bunch of champs without having paid any money. Yep. Yeah, they, they, all, they are also upping the number, though, of champs that you need. Uh, the number of champs that you need to play ranked mode has been increased from 14 to 16. Oh. Because of the free-to-play champs being removed. I didn't even know that there was that 14 requirement. Yep. Yeah, you needed to have at least 14 champs, which there, by the time you hit 30, there, you should have no problem hitting that without buying any RP whatsoever. Yeah. 
So yeah, um, the one of the founders of Riot also recently decided to have an AMA session. Uh, Mark Mer- uh, Merles, also known as Trindamir, uh, had an AMA session. Nothing really interesting got asked. I mean, th- these are all kind of things we've heard before. Um, keynotes are that, you know, Evelyn is in the process of getting reworked, but her rework is going to come whenever a solution is found to the stealth problem. Like, they, they flat out said that they've been trying to work on this and that they just haven't found a solution that works. Whatever. it It's what it is. Um, realistically, there were no other really great questions that got asked. I mean, the, the question came up of ELO hell, is that really a thing? And, you know, he, he basically said that, yeah, it's unfortunate that this place exists where, where bad players get stuck and you have to fight your way through it, but most good players can do that in, within the span of a week or two. And that just by being above average as a player, you will fight your way out of there. The idea of ELO hell itself is that I am way better than my ELO represents, and because I am in this region, I cannot get my ELO higher because I'm being matched with people who are really bad. And so if it is possible for by playing well to get out of that region, then that does not qualify as ELO hell at all. And I I think we all have known for a long time that the people who complain that the system is unfair in that way are just making excuses for not being very good. Yeah, ch- chances are if you're really in this bad of a place, then you just playing a good character, you should be able to carry the game to the point of winning. Like, if they're honestly that Somebody's fucking bad... Somebody's about to shut off their phone. Oh, man. Of course. The natural course trick of ELO of Hell is that while you'll get bad teammates, your opponent should also be bad. Of course. So that should make you able to get out. Because you'll have four bad people on your team and one good person, while they have five bad people on their team on average. Right. Um, I hate to tell you, but one good person playing one of those power champs can win games. I've seen it done. Big backpack. I have watched a Riven kick my entire team's ass. I, I have seen a Kogma carry an entire team once or twice. Right. It, it is a thing. And if you are that badly in ELO hell, you can fight your way out because the people on the other team must be pretty effing terrible. Yep. So, there has been a development with the naming dispute between Blizzard and Valve, which is that Valve has is has the final rights I don't know that this was a legally binding decision, but it was an agreement between Blizzard and Valve that Valve is going to call Dota 2 Dota 2, and Blizzard Dota is now Blizzard All-Stars. So Blizzard gave up the Dota name. I'm really not surprised, considering they weren't the ones who possessed the name Dota to begin with, because it was a mod created by fans. Yeah, but Valve has not a ton of claim to it either. They hired the maintainer... But the maintainer wasn't yeah. the creator. Right. The, if I remember correctly, the creator is actually one of the people who went and founded Riot. Yes, that is correct. And Riot has le- released an official statement that they believe Dota should be available for everybody to use. That nobody should own the name. Right. Which I'm probably okay with, especially considering how ambiguous it is. But the truth of the matter yeah, is... Yeah, but but we're talking about Valve, and let's just say Team Fortress, Counter-Strike, trademarks officially owned. Yep, but with both of those games, they hired the original creators. Right. The people who well, came up with the name Counter-Strike work at Valve now. Well, in this case, the, the original creator of Dota holds no rights to it, so hiring the retainer is good enough. Sure. So, that's the actual results. Blizzard Dota is now Blizzard All-Stars. Which I have no interest in trying whatsoever, because I think for the most part, Blizzard's signature character's not that great. But, I mean, the characters don't matter so much in a MOBA if the gameplay is good. 
No, I think the characters are what makes the MOBA. Uh, kind of. Because I feel like the mechanics rip. of the characters... The, it is the champions that make the difference, but it's the mechanics yeah. of the champions, not the lore of them. A exactly, and I don't feel strongly for any of the Blizzard champs that they have represented with this game. Okay, well, if that's what you're saying, then sure. Yeah, I, I give credit to Blizzard as a great game company. I do not give them a ton of credit as great storytellers. Just a personal preference thing. I'm I'm not all for it. I, I understand what Diablo is and what its plot is. At the same time, I recognize the fact that a highly skilled uh, fan fiction writer could probably do the same thing. Yeah, pretty much. I've, people always say that licensed genre fiction novels aren't very good, but I've had a lot of luck in my life with reading licensed genre fiction and it being pretty good. It all depends on the the, the license. I, I'm sure I that's... Well, it all depends on the writers, too. Right. But I, I, I think I have coincidentally stumbled upon the good books that just happen to also be licensed genre fiction. I've had some good luck with the StarCraft universe in that way, but that does not reflect on the games themselves very much. Right. The, the game itself has pretty mediocre writing, but, like, I, I've read the World of Warcraft novels, a couple of them anyway. I, I read the Cataclysm novel, The Sundering, and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was told for by a... A really great author it addressed the stories that needed to be told to bring the games in line and make a coherent story that coherence wasn't in the game cataclysm just like happened in one patch and no one really knew why these changes occurred yep so here's an amusing sidebar uh recently i'm not sure if it's actually out or coming out today or tomorrow or something but sonic 4 episode 2 is coming out and it is it came out today and it has a whole new engine and there are no additional episodes planned so when they released sonic 4 episode 1 they were like it's episodic gaming frequent releases and low prices and there's gonna be a bunch of them that tell a story and so at Having used the episode for... Having used the engine for episode one only once, and this being the final episode, unless somehow it makes a ton of money. There's good work on getting that episodic thing right, Sonic Team. <laughs> yep, there were technically two of them. There were episodes. You can put the S on the end of episodes there. <laughs> Pixie, I believe you had a story you wanted to talk about. Alright, yeah, so I got my monthly Game Informer in. Yeah, you actually get the paper copy of that? I just get an email that I delete. I thought I was too, but hey, it makes good wrapping paper. It's true. I, I have received a couple presents wrapped in Game Informer. The Game Informer hey, is cheap. notorious for being sort of the first place to break industry information. They, they yeah, can't because delete a it's GameStop's magazine. It, it is a magazine wholly owned by GameStop. Anyway, so a, a lot of it's, you know, just air quote reviews and ads and some other stuff. But I found this little thing tucked in the back. The release date to be announced. There's only two pictures with screenshots of it. And can I get a racist check here? The game's called Guacamelee. Yep, this is a thing. I, I saw preview videos of this game from PAX, actually. And, and so... According to this um, little blurb written by Mr. Diane Rickert, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, it uh, apparently plays like Metroid would if it were melee-based and featured luchadores instead of intergalactic bounty hunters. Yep. If you play as Juan Aguacate, um, for those of you not to up-to-date on your Spanish, Aguacate is Spanish for avocado. Yep. <laughs> Hence the title of the game. Uh, this has not gotten to a, the racist part yet. Who nope. is a down and out field worker? That's the that racist the part. The world of Lucha Libre. Yeah. <laughs> so. I I don't know about the down and out field worker part really, 
But uh, I'll say that most cultures have field workers at Wait, some point. But no, it's it's that that is the racial stereotype. I know though. that that all of these things compiled together. Right. Like I, I understand. Super racist. I understand the theme that they want to establish here. That like we're we're going off of uh, a, a theme There's of no of the of luchadors and and Mexican folklore. And, you know, it looks really cool. I'll, I'll give it that. I, I get the Metroidvania thing. I get the Luchador thing because of the wrestling moves, and I think that's really cool. I don't know about the down-and-out field worker. I, I am kind of shaky well, about that. Well, it's going to have been like there was somebody sitting in a conference room or a couple of employees of this company who are like, okay, what comes to mind when I say Mexican? And somebody what, shouts what we Luchador. Want this jo- guy's and job somebody to be shouts a- Guacamole. And somebody shouts Migrant Laborer. It's like, come on, <laughs> guys. Oh. That's slightly that that's racist. That's not slightly racist. I, that's racist. So I'm calling it. This game sounds racist. Uh, another funny thing is they said it's like Metroid if Metroid had luchadors instead of bounty hunters. There's only one bounty hunter in Metroid. Is by luchadors they no, mean luchador and you, bounty no. hunters they mean bounty hunter. No, we actually do know multiple bounty hunters in the Metroid universe. That was the plot of one of the uh, one of the games that you were being hunted by other bounty hunters. Well, which game was that? I'm trying to remember which Metroid that was. It was one of the more recent ones. To the Google. Yeah, there was definitely one of them where you had to take on rival bounty hunters. You guys can look that up. Oh. But no, Guacamelee in general looks like a really interesting game. I like the combat system. I think it looks really cool. I can't quite get behind the migrant field worker thing. Like, I love the idea of switching between the normal world and the world of the dead. And that actually changes, like, the environment. You sometimes need to do this just for, for jumping puzzles and stuff. Uh, I've got one Metroid Prime Hunter. That would be it. There it is. Ah, okay, it's a, it's a DS, that's why. It was off So yes, radar. we've established in the Metroid universe that, yeah, there are other bounty hunters besides Samus. I, I agree with you that I'm interested in the genre, and there's not really a ton of Metroidvanias that get thrown out there for as much well, as it's a Well, especially not ones that genre. focus on melee action. No. Like, that's... It's usually you program ranged into these things because it's far easier to deal with uh, for enemy programming. Especially for boss fights. Like, melee in boss fights is always hell for programmers. So is this a uh, console only, I assume? Um, let me check. I'm not sure what we're planning to be released on. I'm pretty sure we're going to have this as a downloadable. That sounds right. Yep. Um, looks like we don't have any announcements as to what it's coming for. Oh, regardless, I would not be buying it or probably covering it very much, but hey, it exists. I like the genre. It exists. There there was a a demo at PAX this year. Yep, the only thing we know is Q1 2013. Yep. Check back then for not more coverage. <laughs> Pass. Aw, oh, that's sad. Uh, then again, we still haven't even covered Fez, which I was truly excited about. We, we never covered Super Monday Night Combat. We need to play that sometime. Sorry, I've been a little busy with League and now Diablo. Uh, tell me about your new apartment. Are you all unpacked? I really we're going into the the nerd talk studio 3.0 yeah I'm, I'm totally unpacked now um apart from being a little dirty because the previous tenants hadn't cleaned it at all it's a really nice place like we'll, we'll get some pictures and send them I guess uh, I hear you're you were moving from just one uh, apartment to another within the same leaser infrastructure like the buildings are owned yeah, by the same I, people I'm with the I'm with the same company, and I'm only one building over, so the vast majority of my stuff was just carried into this apartment. Uh, Pixie told me there was a scene wherein they were threatening to evict you, and you were like, you haven't given me the keys to my new one yet. Oh yeah, I had people coming by my previous apartment like, why aren't you out yet? Like, Because you haven't given me keys to the place I'm going. Well, why aren't you out? 
because I don't have anywhere to put my stuff until you give me those keys. And is this place affiliated with the university? Um, unofficially? Like well, they should know Sam, how the rhythms they, of the semester the universi- work. The right. university recommends Sammy to people going into their junior and senior years for their apartments. We might want to bleep the name. Okay. The, yeah, we can bleep See, the name. Seeing as you currently live here. Right. Um, the, the, uh, the thing, the shtick with these guys also is that these guys only rent to students. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. so they should I understand mean, that be, the semester is ending not a student and, and they need here. to give you your new keys so you can move. Which is kind of nice because that means you don't have, like, in theory, people with kids and old people. With kids. No, you still do have people with kids. I said in theory. In theory. In theory is not what actually happens. Like, there are, like, I, I guess in theory a 70-year-old could be in university, but they're not you. Yeah, I mean, technically I'm a grad student at almost 30, and I'm in here. I, I get weird looks You're sometimes. not an old person as much as, like... But I still do, as I much still as do get weird looks sometimes. it is our show motto to call you old. Right. Okay, so, like, you're kind of old, but not, like, super old. <laughs> I'm not super old. I'm older than would be expected from a student, but I'm in line for a grad student. At the university in my town, it's kind of funny, because there's proper student housing, and then there's, like, this weird ghetto on the far side of campus that's called married student housing. Uh, it's like... Married student uh, housing? Once, once you have kids in a family, you go over here to this, this ghetto, because we don't want you anymore. So there's, like, the We're ready for student you to be housing. Gone. And the old people student housing. Right. Um, I actually do have one more thing that we could use for the show tonight. Something I wanted to talk about. Yeah. Um, Capcom has decided to reevaluate their business practices. And is... that They've actually had their head of sales. I think that's what his title is. Let me find this. Maybe it would help to have the story up before you start. I, I had about seen it. it on another site earlier. The escapist had been discussed. What it. the story is is that they're probably going to back away from on disc DLC, which yeah, I, I bet Sen is happy about. I, I have mixed emotions. The the unfortunate thing about it is that it doesn't apply to the one piece of content I actually was interested in. Um, yeah, it was Christian uh, Stevenson who came out and said that, you know, we understand that fans are outraged about the on disc DLC thing, and, and we've been reevaluating it and decided that we're not going to do this in the future. We're going to change the methods that we deliver this post production content. Um, and the unfortunate thing is, they're not doing anything about it in terms of Capcom uh, or Street Fighter Cross Tekken. They're still going to do this. They're still going to sell me these 12 characters for 20 bucks that are already on the game disc that I have to pay $60 for. So they might change their strategy in this regard in the future, but for the stuff that's coming out now... That's currently out. They're not doing anything. It's too late. And yeah, I f- I'm not as opposed to on-disc DLC as a bunch of people are, because it's sort of a way to buy your content piecemeal. And at some level, you're always paying for some amount of content, and if you think that content is a good value, then you buy it, and if you think it's not a good value, you don't. And Yeah, but this, this is the case argument that, well... If I know these 12 characters were done as part of the finished product that you charged me for, because they were on the disc, I don't want you to charge me for them. I want those characters as my initial $60 to play the game. I consider a fighting game's roster part of that fighting game. Right. But I don't view this as fundamentally different from any other retail model, such as old expansion packs or even... What Capcom is notorious for, brand new games with added characters. Because... It's not really... It, it's the fact that the, it was so blatant that the... Yeah, this content was artificially blocked off despite being done and ready to go at launch. If it... I don't care if it was done when the game came out, if it wasn't on the disc. If you didn't put it on there, that's fine. 
if you just decided, you know what, remove these guys, we'll put them in later. But in effect, the only trade-off there is that you get a worse user experience for online play because some people haven't downloaded all the characters. But how is it a worse experience, though, when every single player has to patch their content to play the game? We're living in an age where everyone who's playing online had to download the patch. You know, I don't own all of the characters for Blaze Blue. I can still play with those people online because I had to patch my game to be playing online to begin Microsoft with. Microsoft policies limit the size in bits of a patch. And so, in order for them to put characters in patches, they need to limit the amount of files and bits those characters use. So if you have a character that has new textures and new models and new animations, then maybe your patches aren't going to fit Microsoft's patch size limits. Um, I don't know if you know this, but fighting games are always notoriously small on their game discs. Uh, this is actually this is something that has really come up. There, I I'll have to find you the actual name of the game, but there have been lots of reviewers stating games having the problem of DLC, and then the matchmaking is shitty between DLC characters and people who just have the disc version. There have been a number of games that have had that problem. And so, if you're saying it's okay to have the characters made before it's shipped, but you don't want them to be on the disc, all you're really saying is you want the matchmaking to not work as well. But I haven't had that problem in any of the games where I've played that have used that. For instance, the new Mortal Kombat. I don't have a single one of those downloadable characters, but I've still played matches against the people who have. I haven't seen any difference. I got my ass kicked because I think they're more powerful, but eh. Frankly, I think Freddy Krueger could take three-fourths of the cast. No, I, I, I can see why people don't like it, and I see why people do, but I, I feel like you always have the option of, of buying Capcom. or not buying content. Right. Well, in this case, I've made the conscious choice not to, because I think that the game isn't what it could be without those 12 characters, and I'm not prepared to throw down $80 for a fighting game to have the complete list. You know, I went in for Marvel or Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom because of the fact that those characters weren't done at the time when the game was released, and I had no problem buying a new, better version of the game. You know, they updated more than just the roster. Right. They updated the fundamental systems of how the game worked to improve the competitive nature of the game. In this case, all I'm getting is those 12 characters who were previously blocked off. Well, in any case, the issue of on-disc on DLC will completely go away when we get rid of discs, which is coming. <laughs> and uh, my other comment... And I'm so freaking excited for it. I'm, I'm ready. The, the moral for tonight's nerd talk, discs suck. I, uh, yes, <laughs> endorsed. You gotta get up and change them out in your system? It's terrible! Mass Effect's all like, put in disc 2 and I'm all like, my ass is comfy. L.A. Noir had four, four DVDs. That really sucks. I had to change them out for every promotion you got in the game. It was terrible. But I, even without the on-disc problem, I'll say that the way I have been burned by DLC, sort of, is that I didn't play any Mass Effect DLC in any of the games because... I never got around to it. If it, and that just means I never experienced those stories and never will, just because it was more inconvenient to get to them, and that kind of sucks. So I I, I see both sides of it, and I'm not going to boycott companies for using DLC, but they use it sparingly. Now, this is one case where a fighting game that I previously was very, very interested in, I mean, I gave a very positive review to Capcom, 
or at uh, Street Fighter Cross Tekken. I will not be buying that game unless a either an ultimate set comes out. You know, I, I really could believe in that. If an ultimate Street Fighter Cross Tekken comes out for $40, I'll pick that up. Sure. If I can have all the content. Uh, but how much did you but, pay if you bought MVC3 and then you MVC3? MVC uh, retailed for $50. Ultimate retailed for $40. They were sold half a year apart. So you pay 90 I did. And you know what? The only reason I could justify that was because I really felt like that game was more than just a, uh, a, a roster update. They fundamentally changed things about the game and how it worked. They added new artwork for levels. They added new menu systems. They added an entire new game mode. Conceivably, could a roster update be big enough to be comparable to that change? If the, there were... Only only if it fundamentally changes how the game's meta works. Okay. Well, I guess I don't. we don't have any conclusions for you here today, listener. Right. On this DLC... There, there are no conclusions on Nerd Talk. Be sad about existence. And I think that's all we got for the show. And now it's time to go get crunk. Crunk time. <laughs> In the meantime, I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. And I'm Pyrosim. Drink! And listening to Nerd Talk. We're gonna go drink. I was instructing the listener to.